Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, your presenters. So today there's going to be myself. I'm Amanda Shiga. I am Vice President of our Digital Division here at Nonlinear Creations. I'm a Sitecore MVP, and I have been around at Nonlinear for about, for about nine years. So I've seen my share of, uh, of Sitecore implementations and upgrades. And also my colleague Jason is also joining us, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm coming from a .NET development background over the many years I've been uh, in the tech field. And for the last four years, I've been here at Nonlinear, learning the ways of Sitecore, and uh, now become a Sitecore MVP. I'm currently working on a lot of upgrades, so I'm, I'm here to help out with some of the deep dive technical questions. Yeah, Jason is actually in the midst, as we speak, in the midst of an upgrade to 8, so he's got uh, some a wealth of information he can share with us. Um, so if you look in, in your GoToMeeting console, um, there is a couple of polls that we set up. Um, you'll see that in one of the drop downs. If you expand that, I did put, we did put a couple of questions in there. Um, and uh, if you're so inclined, first question is what version of Sitecore are you on currently? And the second question is whether you've upgraded your Sitecore instance before. Um, so if you're able to find that, uh, that would give us some context about who's, who's on the line and what the experience is in there. If you do have questions during the webinar, um, please feel free to type them either into the questions or chat section. And then uh, once we're done, um, we can go and review those together. Okay. Um, so in terms of upgrading, so the first thing really to do is get a sense of, of your current version and where you're situated. Um, uh, most organizations are sitting somewhere between 6.5 and 8.1 at this point. Um, there are a few folks who might be on um, lower versions of 6 still, um, but this is generally where most people are sitting right now. Um, and this little chart just gives you a, a basic sense of um, how Sitecore has improved uh, increased in the, the features in each uh, version as they've gone up. So you have uh, the second generation DMS coming in. Seven was all about content scalability, the buckets feature, if you heard about that. Seven also had some nice publishing goodies like re publish related items, which was very nice for a lot of people. 7.5 um, was really about analytics scalability, and then 8, of course, is next generation experience platform, which everyone's very excited about. Um, it looks like about half the people on the call are on 6 still at this point. So uh, let me look at this one. So in terms of the Sitecore 8, um, there's a lot of hype around this version. It was released in uh, December, and really it is being rebranded the Experience Platform, and it promises um, a truly strategic marketing platform. Um, these are some of the uh, points that they raise in terms of describing it. Um, all of it really centers around this thing called the XDB. There's always a lot of questions about that, and we do have some time allocated to the XDB in this webinar. Um, but really, it's about um, truly scaling out this capability to collect um, very granular data about all interactions of visitors on your site and using that to predict the future and provide very personalized interactions. This concept of the single view of the customer, so not only what they're doing in Sitecore, but pulling in information about them from other sources like CRM, et cetera. Um, and for the data scientists in the room, um, uh, the ability to do a deep dive uh, on that if that's if that's what you're looking to do. Um, so that's really the promise of Sitecore 8. Um, and if we go back down, uh, there's another term that's floating around called Sitecore ADA. You might have heard it, and I've included it here because I've had enough organizations ask about it. Um, ADA um, and ADA and XP are a little bit synonymous, but not entirely. ADA was a, an older advertising term that stood for, I think, attention, interest, um, desire, something else. They've repurposed this. If you look at the orange bar in the middle, you'll see that it, in Sitecore's world, it stands for analytics, insights, decisions, and automation. And really what this graphic is explaining is that when they say ADA, they really are um, trying to convey um, that experience platform functionality that really spans um, all of the channels, um, all of the types of content that's managed, um, different databases of customer data, and then integration points. And it's important to know that this is not just 
the core site core product they're talking here, but also some of the acquisitions and third party modules that they folded into that that broad vision. So for example, commerce server uh, is included in there. So if you hear the term ADA, um, really it's just meant to encompass this new Sitecore 8 XP functionality um, across content and across channels. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit for you. Um, common scenarios. So when you're looking to upgrade, there might be a few scenarios you find yourself in. Um, organizations want to fully leverage the Sitecore investment. They, they love what they hear about 8 and they want it. Um, infrastructure gets outdated, needs to be upgraded. Um, Frustrations in daily operations. So we hear a lot about things like browser compatibility and page editor mode not working. Um, the team is in a comfortable place, so it can be a battle to get people trained and comfortable, um, and this is across content authors, marketers, IT developers. Um, once they get very comfortable with a certain version, um, you know, that's a good spot to be in. So that's certainly a consideration when upgrading, because every time you upgrade, of course, there's, there's a training consideration. Um, needing to justify the expense of an upgrade is always a concern. Um, and then the opportunity, if, uh, if enhancements or redesigns are coming down the pipe, you know, is this also the opportunity or the time to do an upgrade at the same time and start taking advantage of some newer features? Um, so my, I, I would your guess that a lot of folks on the phone are, might be falling into one or more of these categories. Um, and the question really is, you know, why, why are we upgrading? And that leads into the justification for upgrading. Um, and there's a few slides I want to take you through here. Um, the release cycles are fast. So I've included at the bottom here um, the Gartner Magic Quadrants, and they've, I think, new last year they split it out. They have, they've had the web content management one for quite some time, but um, newer is digital marketing hubs, and Sitecore appears in both of them. It's probably a little hard to read, um, but the race is on. and uh, you know, in, in the right-hand one, Adobe and Sitecore, of course, are head-to-head, -head, and then there's a bunch of other players in digital marketing. But as you can see with, uh, with my dates here, um, the releases come fast, and it can be challenging for both partners and organizations to keep up with this. Um, you know, this is averaging roughly twice a year for a major upgrade kind of thing. Um, so it, it's fast, and if you want to take advantage of the newest features, there's a certain nimbleness you need to have to approaching it. Um, Sitecore um, support deprecates, so this doesn't only happen on Sitecore, it happens on the ecosystem that supports it, so um, your servers, your Windows, your SQL Server, everything else like that. Um, this is a table taken from a resource that Sitecore publishes, I've given the link at the bottom, um, and, and this is only showing part of the table, um, but essentially they've started to put dates against certain versions of Sitecore when mainstream and extended support will start to end. So if you're staying too long on uh, an early version of Sitecore, you will have a date coming up where your support will start to be affected. Um, so that's certainly a factor. Um, why upgrade? There's, uh, there's a few categories of improvements, but certainly efficiency is a big one, and this can be a very strong argument for a lot of organizations. Um, ongoing pain points. As I mentioned before, um, uh, browser compatibility is a big one. We get a lot of comments on that. Um, page editor, there seems to be quite a few implementations out there um, where folks are using content editor because page editor is either not working or the solution was not implemented for it. Um, and that's, that may be working operationally, um, but that will become um, quite an obstacle to using some of the newer DMS and Sitecore 8 features. Um, it's really all about the page editor mode where these types of things are administered. Um, Increasing independence of the marketing team. So again, that, that's certainly the, the, the road that Sitecore is on. So things like the A-B testing function, um, getting a massive overhaul in eight, which is wonderful, um, really is again all about enabling um, the marketing team to, to do this type of optimization fairly independently. Um, support for cloud, um, CMS part of Sitecore has been supported there um, for a while now, and as I'll talk about later, you now have a cloud option for the XDB as well. Broader support for multiple channels, um, email campaign management, et cetera, all of that kind of support is increasingly expanded within the Sitecore platform. Improvements to content search, this was a big one in 7. Um, they revamped the whole search API um, and improved searching within the content author environment. 
Um, this is also a bit of a newer trend, a provider-based architecture. So what I mean by that is um, if, you're, if you're using uh, other platforms for things like search, um, media, video management, e-commerce, um, the trend inside of Sitecore really seems to be the ability to swap out um, uh, what, what's either nat in there natively or swap out um, other options for platforms. Um, so to give you an example, um, Sitecore ships with uh, a Lucene search provider natively and Coveo, who is a third-party technology integrator, um, uh, you can swap out the search function both for your site search and for your internal search entirely with the, with the Coveo um, module. And then finally, latest developer tools. So of course, as Sitecore um, upgrades, so does things like Visual Studio, um, continuous integration tools, etc. So staying up to date means the developers also get to use the latest stuff, which they love. There's also functional enhancements. Um, so new arsenal of marketing capabilities. If you've seen any demo of eight, if you've been to symposium, you'll see how bright and shiny those are, and, and people are quite eager to get their hands on them and start leveraging them. Um, in particular, on the front of lead nurturing and customer service, um, there are some really nice use cases for things like the customer card. If you've seen any demo, um, that's uh, basically a, a re tabbed report that lets you, um, if you can connect a if you can connect a browser session to a particular CRM user or a named individual, if you're B2B, for example, and you're actually targeting um, individuals on the sales front, um, having this tabbed report of, of absolutely every touch point, every activity, every goal conversion this, this person has done, you know, is enormously powerful for when you call them or when you enroll them in an engagement plan. Um, so there's some pretty compelling stories there. Newly supported modules, an example is the Federated Experience Manager, which has come out for, I think, 7.2 and higher, um, which actually lets you tag and track behavior on sites not served by Sitecore, and again, fold that into the, the global picture. Opportunity for redesign, um, rebuild, infrastructure upgrade. Probably one of the biggest opportunities people see um, with going to aid is um, refreshing their infrastructure, um, especially because, of course, things like the Windows Server version changes in terms of what's supported. Um, we have a few clients right now who are doing exactly that. They are taking the opportunity to procure um, all new hardware and give everything a refresh. And then uh, multilingual websites, this is a smaller enhancement, but um, in the newest version, um, the, uh, you have the ability to have uh, assigned different layouts and sub-layouts to different languages, so you're not tied to the same presentation um, for different languages through the site. So that does allow for increased flexibility there. What happens if you delay? Um, I've already covered a little bit of this. Um, but you will start to face a deprecating ecosystem and support. Um, Sitecore itself, of course, um, Sitecore modules. The only caution there is that um, while the Sitecore modules deprecate, um, they don't always catch up either to where Sitecore is. So you have Sitecore available on 8 right now, but not necessarily every module has a version available that's compatible with 8. So there is an exercise in here to do in terms of in taking an inventory of what modules you're using. Um, an example would be Web Forms for Marketers and making sure that on your upgrade path, um, everything's going to work together across the board. And of course, you're supporting infrastructure. Um, you may be tolerating issues that are resolved. Um, Sitecore issues um, numerous fixes uh, with each release, and they also release specific patches uh, for problems that have come up. So there may be a fix for something that, that you're tolerating. Um, the longer you wait, the bigger it can be. And a perfect example of this is that, um, that search API change that came in version 7. So if you're, for example, if you're on 6 right now and you have a search solution that's built on, uh, built on Lucene that's using the, the version 6 Lucene API inside of Sitecore, um, you will have to revisit that moving up to 7 and 8 um, because the API has changed. Um, and that's one example of, of the impact of waiting a longer time. You can do it incrementally, um, or you can do it big, big bang, um, but the incremental um, is likely less painful. 
Um, and then, of course, you might be missing the full ROI on your license purchase if you're not uh, upgraded to take full advantage of, of all the new and shiny things. So what's the anatomy of an upgrade? What does it actually look like to do it? Um, this is a diagram of our typical process uh, when we do this for clients or with clients. Um, I'll call out a few things here. So upgrade preparation gets a star. Um, what we found most recently is that whether your team built your build or whether a, a third party team built it, um, it's useful to do a small audit at the beginning you know, not least just to do that inventory I mentioned of what's actually in this solution, what modules are we using and not using, um, you know, has has our code been built in, in an abstracted way, do we have tiers, et cetera, things like that, um, because this will really um, help you plan how exactly you have to address the rest of the steps here. So that is highly recommended. Um, I think that's something we're going to do almost uh, across the board going forward for the upgrades that we do. Um, infrastructure also gets a shout out here, so not only checking um, the, the server requirements for the, the version you'd like to go to, um, but the XDB is a huge part of that, I will get into that later. Um, release and training planning, so that's around making sure you are uh, thinking of the impact to your team and starting to use the new version, as well as uh, whether or not you have concurrent initiatives. If you've got uh, uh, other marketing initiatives going on that, that include the website, campaigns, um, landing pages being built, all of this will need to be considered and coordinated, um, especially if your upgrade is going to be uh, a bigger effort. And what I mean there is uh, planning when you're going to do things like content freezes and uh, downtime of various environments. Um, if you've got a, a fairly robust promotion process internally, um, it's good not to underestimate the impact of that. Uh, we do a local dress rehearsal. So what that means is we, we take an entirely local isolated um, environment where we can play essentially and then we do a dress rehearsal we follow the the exact steps that need to be taken and as we're doing that we are writing what we call an upgrade book so for each step we're recording you know this is what was done these were the obstacles encountered this was the workaround and the idea there is then you'll have this wonderful book and when you go to actually apply the upgrade in the rest of your environments um, uh, it, it becomes very easy to go step by step and also to have a broader team working on that who can also follow step by step. Um, assessment of fixes um, is something uh, that, might, that might yield extra effort. So if you have encountered obstacles along the way in your dress rehearsal, um, usually it's time to stop and kind of say, okay, you know, this isn't working or this is this is going to be a problem and assess um, whether you need to stop and address it immediately or whether it can be addressed, addressed thereafter. So one decision point there is, um, to give you an example, page editor mode. Do you need it to be working immediately or is it more important to just get the upgrade done and then fix page editor mode thereafter? And there's pros and cons to whether you do that before or after, but that's sort of an, an analysis phase to consider those things. Um, a few other examples, the .NET framework obviously um, increases to 4.5 with 8. Um, API changes, I mentioned those. QA and regression, this can be small or this can be significant. And really the lever there is whether you've got um, a big uh, custom application sitting inside of your site course solution as well. So this could be custom elements on the site or it could be an integration layer. Um, and if, if it's talking to other systems, um, really the regression becomes more significant depending on, on the, the, uh, the size of how much you need to test there and make sure everything's still working thereafter. Um, as I mentioned, coordinate downtime and then um, proceed to apply to various instances uh, through your dev staging and production. So that's generally what it looks like. In terms of how long it takes, um, there's two versions of this. <laughs> if you're going, if you're doing a very small incremental upgrade, it can be very quick. Um, you know, seven one to seven two, six four to six six. If you're doing a bigger jump, six five to eight, um, it's not to be underestimated. Um, this can generally range 
three to four weeks or more, again, depending on how big your solution is and, and how much in there needs to be um, upgraded or considered. Um, so that's generally the time frames that we're seeing for this, for this task. You can make your life easier before you upgrade, and you can actually make it easier right out of the gate if you are doing a new build or looking to do a new build. Um, one of the biggest ones, and, and this is a, a developer, a developer call-out, solution architect call-out here, um, it's really important to make sure your build is properly architected. So things like clean abstractions, think of swapping out um, points of integration, objects, um, think of being able to do that as cleanly as possible because that, of course, will continue to evolve as the product evolves. Um, DMS-friendly component-based architecture. So when we say DMS-friendly, it's really all about um, uh, the page editor and making sure that we can um, apply things like personalization rules and tests to components within the page that they are data source driven, etc. Um, again, this will make sure that you you won't have obstacles to using those new features. Um, this uh, third one here is a big one. Jason's just run into this himself. Um, Ability to cleanly separate your solution from the core site core product. Um, and maybe I'll pause and see if Jason wants to comment on this one. Yeah, just, just for those on the call, uh, to, if, if you're wondering what that is, I, I've run into this with uh, several situations where folks have uh, basically put the entire product into source control. So what happens is they go to an upgrade and now they have some 8,000 files in source control that now need to be moved, updated, checked in, checked out, um, just to get your solution up to date. Uh, so what you want to do is make sure you know what it is that you changed versus what is just part of the product that's sitting underneath your solution. That will make your, your upgrade a lot easier if you've got that identified. Thanks, Jason. Um, if you can include, in, include rhythm of upgrades and budget forecasting, as I mentioned before, the, the major releases um, seem to be coming about twice a year um, or more often. Um, you know, once a year might be reasonable, but if you can um, anticipate those things, it, it will be easier to keep doing them incrementally um, instead of having to do a big bang at some point. Um, keep up to date as much as you can with Sitecore's roadmap. Um, plan training on new versions. Again, the, the the platform vendors are, are moving very quickly with their feature enhancements, um, and it can sometimes be challenging to keep up with them. Um, but as much as you can, anticipate what's coming, and then you can try to align uh, your team and, and your expectations and resources around that. Um, and then this one's important. Check your site core license. Um, so not least because of XDB, um, but there are some older licensing agreements I know where um, they, they didn't include DMS or there was some uh, special configuration um, that had to be considered. So uh, I would encourage everyone to check with their site core um, account manager and make sure that if you are planning to go up to 7.5 or 8 that you are fully covered um, and again there's entire separate conversation on how they are selling and licensing the XDB as well so you will want to talk to Sitecore directly on, on those two points. Don't forget your modules. Um, here's another great resource. I pasted in the top part of the table. The link is at the bottom. Um, they have, uh, Sitecore has published a handy table that shows you um, for any number of modules you might be using um, their compatibility with versions of Sitecore and whether they've been released um, for those particular versions. So again, it's a great resource when you're doing that inventory of what's actually being used in your build and compatibility. Um, there's two ways to approach an upgrade. Um, the first way is we're calling an in-place upgrade, um, and this might be what most people are familiar with if they've done one before. Um, Sitecore does document a step-by-step -step incremental upgrade. So if you go onto SDN and you go to a particular version, you can find instructions to go from version X to version Y, and usually what it looks like is a series of steps that include um, an update package that you would install with installation wizard. There's often configuration file updates, module upgrades, um, database scripts to run to update the schema. Um, so we found that this works fairly well for smaller jumps. Um, again, you know, 7.0 to 7.2, 6.4 to 6.6. Um, 
but if you're considering a bigger jump, so for example, if you're going to from 6.5 to 8, um, the, there, there's some broader things to consider here. So often, as I mentioned before, this is um, a time to update and refresh infrastructure, especially if what you're running for 6.5 um, won't support 8. Um, Aid also introduces um, additional, a lot actually, a lot more additional scaling options. You have things like session servers, you have the XDB, you have processing servers. Um, so really part of that upgrade prep step as the first step um, is a deep dive that we recommend on all of this stuff. Sit down with an architect, pull up some infrastructure diagrams and really understand um, the breadth of this footprint that it's become for eight, whether or not you need all of this or not, and it's usually a function of redundancy combined with the amount of traffic you have, um, but that um, is, is a very important conversation to have at this point. Um, API changes are almost always at the name of the game, and then uh, there's a number of other developer level details. Um, Jason is <laughs> intimate with them at this point, um, but, uh, the, the opportunity for the bigger jumps to, instead of doing an incremental, instead to set up new infrastructure, install a clean base site core 8, and then actually import the solution is the second approach that you can do. Um, and uh, it's, it's equally viable as doing the in-place upgrade. Um, so that's certainly a, an assessment and a conversation you want to have. Um, making the case to upgrade. So, um, you know, the soft ROI, there's, in this slide deck alone, there's numerous arguments for um, doing an upgrade and justifications and advantages. Um, if you are looking to, to do a bit of a harder ROI, um, it's not as easy to quantify or describe, um, but we've advised folks to really look at framing this as solving a specific issue. So really, you know, really granular tactical things that can be measured, content author time, publishing time from concept or from writing to publication, um, IT costs averaged over a number of years, baseline and post upgrade KPIs. Um, we're actually working on an asset right now to, uh, to give some examples of this and to help people um, uh, frame and, and use some calculations to support this. Um, but probably our, our broader advice, um, as we tell all our clients, is um, do try to start embracing a culture of measurement and optimization, um, whether you go fully, you know, agile marketing or not. Um, it's only helpful to be able to um, regularly measure things. Um, so even if it's as simple as, you know, before, before an initiative or before an enhancement, you are grabbing some KPIs at that point and then measuring thereafter. Um, getting in the rhythm of doing that um, will just give you lots of ammunition and data to support um, uh, getting things done. Investment costs, there's four main ones. Um, the upgrade itself, um, example, a four-week services engagement plus time from the internal team um, is fairly typical. Implementing new features. so. Once the XDB is deployed, you're probably going to want to start looking at taking some small steps, maybe an initial campaign training uh, for content authors, marketers, and IT staff to support this new version. Um, infrastructure upgrades, server procurement, installation, et cetera, um, and then operations ongoing for that. These are the biggest buckets that you'll probably want to consider when you're um, calculating your investment costs. So um, I'm going to end with everyone's biggest concern. Um, this is probably the number one question that we get, um, which is what is XDB and what do I have to worry about with XDB when I'm upgrading? Um, so this is a, a bit of a helpful interpretation of what it is. Um, XDB is not just MongoDB, um, if that's what you heard. It's, it's, it's basically an entire flow that uses various servers and technology along the way. But the idea here is that um, as visitors come to your site, there is a database that is collecting um, real-time information about every interaction. Um, that gets collected into the Mongo. Um, then we have a processing step here. It's, they've put organizing my thoughts and notes. Um, and what that does is it, it transforms and processes the flat Mongo data into a SQL server, and that's actually used for reporting. Um, so both, uh, both Sitecore and any other system you want to use to pull from that would actually pull from the, from the SQL 
database to do so. Um, and I think, as I recall, there's also a reporting services layer you can put in there that offers that data as available through web services as well. Um, so this flow from collecting the visitor interactions down through to be processed down through to the reporting database um, is really what we mean when we say XDB. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit for you. Um, what do you have to worry about in terms of setting it up? Um, what exactly does it do? There are two models of XDB, um, cloud versus on-premise. Both are available. Now, if you if you bought Sitecore before January 1st, 2015, you do get a nice grandfathering clause um, and you don't go into the new models. The new models are subscription-based um, if you bought your license thereafter. Um, I've chosen this diagram. This is the most complicated scenario, so don't get too scared by it, but I wanted to illustrate um, the extent to which the footprint could grow. So on the left-hand side, you have a very typical um, production Sitecore environment. Um, you have content management nodes, you have content delivery nodes, et cetera, some load balancing. And then on the right-hand side, again, is what we're calling XDB. Um, and in the bottom left of that square, you, you can see your Mongo there, which is collecting. Um, and then this can scale out, again, depending on redundancy needs and depending on what they're calling number of interactions per month. So when you go to your Sitecore rep to talk about um, purchasing or whether your license supports XDB, um, one of the first questions that they'll have and that your partner will have is, well, what's, what's your traffic? Because this is really driven by um, number of interactions per month, which I think corresponds to unique visits, unique visitors or unique visits. Um, and once you have that number, um, you can determine whether you need to scale out. There's a, an aggregation server here so that if you need to offload that transformation of Mongo down to SQL, there's also a reporting service. So if you want to offload, um, if various systems are making requests once the data is being transformed, that can be offloaded as well. And then you can also have a separate XDB index over here, which is on solar. Um, again, this can scale way, way down if you have less redundancy requirements and less traffic, um, but I wanted to give you a sense of the amount of planning. What I really want to emphasize here is the conversations you need to have and the infrastructure planning that you need to have um, and not to underestimate that. Um, it's not just a matter of spinning up a Mongo instance. Um, I'll also mention that MongoDB itself um, has a commercial version and an open source version. Um, Sitecore actually resells the commercial license if you do find that you need that. Um, you might have a policy that uh, prohibits the use of open source software. Um, but uh, there, there's additional documentation. Uh, actually, I should mention that the XDB deserves its own webinar itself, <laughs> um, which, which we may offer in the near future, um, because there's, uh, there's quite a bit of detail once you dig down on each of these things. Um, there's also a cloud option. So if you, if you have no desire to introduce that whole right side into your infrastructure footprint, if you don't have um, uh, Mongo expertise in-house. Um, if you want to really just put all of this into the cloud, um, they do offer cloud version. They have three uh, models, base, uh, three base, uh, base medium and premium, I believe. And again, those are sized based on the number of interactions per month that it supports. Um, so everything, including the processing and aggregation, gets offloaded up into the cloud, and that's a really nice option for organizations who just don't want to, who, who don't want to manage that internally. Um, we are working on an asset, Jason in particular actually is working on, on what will be a beautiful asset called an XDB decision tree. Um, because we're finding it, it is a little bit complex in terms of determining, you know, what license do you have? Do you need cloud? Do you need on-prem? Do you need to scale out these extra server instances? Um, we're, we're working on this to provide some clarity on the licensing and deployment models, so you can expect that to be published uh, within the next couple of weeks um, to give you some help on that particular piece. And then finally, um, once you're on 8, what now what? What do you do once you're successfully upgraded and everything is running? Um, 
probably the number one thing to do is make sure your analytics are collecting properly. Um, whether you've deployed on-premise or in the cloud, um, it's a good thing to just check that uh, the, the volume of traffic you typically expect um, is coming through, uh, it is populating your MongoDB, and it is getting transformed down into your reporting database, and you can execute your, your reports against that, and it's all looking good. Um, then uh, you can look for small steps to start complementing your existing processes. So um, most, organizations, most organizations are likely already running uh, an analytics platform such as Google Analytics. Um, our recommendation is never to just throw that away. Um, keep your Google Analytics, but start to look to Sitecore Analytics for what additional context you can derive from it. Um, again, the big advantage is that you do have the, the visit level information, um, you can drill down to the individual level to see that type of, of granularity. Um, start experimenting with A-B tests and personalization rules. You can take some small steps there. It doesn't have to be overwhelming, um, but just start to, to get familiar with the tool, set up a test or two and see what happens. Um, we like to use journey mapping as a tool quite often actually to identify opportunities for using um, these new features of Sitecore. If you're not clear on what journey mapping is, basically it's, it's a snapshot of a, a customer's end-to-end -end journey with your organization from the very first point that they might hear about you, and that might even be not on your website, but on, on a social channel all the way through your conversion cycle or your sales cycle, and then even post-sale if, if it's a membership organization through to the end of their relationship with your organization. Um, and if you can map that out and, and understand motivations and actions they take, um, it becomes, uh, it, it's a nice exercise to do to see where, you know, personalization works best here, an engagement plan works best there, and it can really help you identify that. Um, and then, of course, take the opportunity to train and inspire. As I understand, Sitecore is still in the midst of developing XDB training. Um, it's not out quite yet, but that will be available. Um, I will take a minute to plug uh, Nonlinear's own offerings. Um, our boot camp um, and accelerator are quite popular. We can support you. Um, the boot camp is a two to three day service where we, we come in and actually sit with your marketing team and using your own actual use cases and marketing scenarios um, we teach and enable um, using these new Sitecore features. Um, the accelerator um, works, we work with you to actually define an initial Sitecore DMS campaign and then support you in executing that and then um, assessing and calculating the success of it thereafter. Um, and then again, I just encourage everyone to experiment a bit with the concept of marketing optimization. Um, you know, fail fast, fail early, try some things, see what works, see what doesn't work, um, and really just um, try to embrace a bit of a culture of, of continually trying new things and, and incrementally optimizing. And that's it. So, um, Britt, do we have any questions? Hi, Amanda. Uh, yes. yes, we have a question from Mike. Yep. Um, he was looking for a price range, um, specifically for 6.5 to 8. Yeah, so um, I would say generally what we're seeing is for, for smaller increments, generally it's sitting around 15 to 20K for services. Um, for 6.5 to 8, um, it's generally a bit more because, again, the complexity is bigger. So I would say maybe 20 to 30K-ish on average. Um, scaling up, of course, if it's a, if it's a complex um, custom application. And we have a question from Rainy John um, asking about the slides, and they will be available. We'll have them up on our website. Um, so the whole um, webinar will be there so that you can watch it again. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? No. Okay, well, I... I, I yeah. I thank you for coming. I hope this was helpful. And of course, uh, these are um, Twitters for myself and Jason. We are happy to uh, answer any questions or have any follow-up calls. If you do want a deeper dive on, on XDB um, in particular, want to understand the licensing model and the infrastructure model, um, we are happy to, uh, happy to help out with that. 
um, and uh, also to, uh, to provide some insight on your particular scenario. So thank you again and have a wonderful day.